Hello and welcome to the latest in the Opto Budget EV Mini Conversion Series. This video will cover in controls. This has been the most challenging part of the project so far for us. And it's also been a challenge to fit it into a video that isn't just a boring stream of information. So the simplest way to do this, I think, is to break it down into chapters. We're going to go with uh, chapter one is the brief. Chapter two will be what we actually did. Chapter three will be what we've learnt. Chapter 4 will be the costs and the time scale. Okay, so the brief for this project is to develop or obtain a control system that will combine the three separate systems we have chosen for the Mini into one overall package that behaves like an OEM electric car, basically. So the three separate systems are the Mitsubishi Outlander motor, inverter, charger, DC-DC and maybe the heater. That's one system if you like because they'll all speak the same sort of language. Then we've got the BMW hybrid battery pack that's been looked after by Simp BMS. That's another language. And then we've got the mini 12 volt system which albeit it's not complicated code, it still all needs to behave correctly as it would originally in the mini. For obviously road rules and MOT regulations etc. So that's the brief, sounds easy as pie doesn't it? <laughs> Basically we started off at the beginning thinking how the hell are we going to control all this stuff? It's, it's not really been done very much in the marketplace, well there's nothing off the shelf you can buy that can control Mitsubishi Outlander components the first thing to think about when the, we were looking at the controls was the BMS which as we've used in the battery episode we used Simp BMS running on a Teensy 3.2 so we didn't see any reason to deviate from that because it seemed to be working great so BMS sorted, Simp BMS, that's easy. The beauty of the Outlander stuff is it's all controlled by a CAN bus so if you get something that can spit out and receive canvas messages, that's very a, a very simplistic view of how to control it, but that was the basic principle. So we're on the Open Inverter Forum chatting to a few different people and one guy offers to send us his canvas shield that works with an Arduino Dew from Germany for 160 euros, I think he charged us. And he told us that while using his canvas shield and his code we could easily control all the Mitsubishi components over Canvas. So that was the perfect solution for us, we sent him the money and waited for the thing to arrive. When it arrived we realised quite we'd been quite naive, when you buy things like this you don't get an instruction manual, you don't get any warranty or customer support and the people on the Open Inverter Forum are massively helpful but at the end of the day it's not their jobs, they're not they're not selling you a commercial product, they're selling you what they've learnt and their information. So you can't expect a warranty and you can't expect um, them to hold your hand while you go through the process. Ultimately, the code that was available for the Outlander motor control would literally get it spinning on the desk. It wasn't suitable for driving in a vehicle or, or creating a driving vehicle. It needs someone who can actually do programming and software. So. While we were grateful to buy the canvas shield and we may even use this to create some sort of dashboard we just had to put that to one side and forget that approach. So we parked the canvas shield and had a look around to see what else was going on. After doing more research we realised that we needed a VCU which is a vehicle control unit and that ties everything together on the vehicle to create an operating car basically. Like things like the throttle control, the brakes, the lights, the contactors, the charger, the DC-DC. All them things need to be controlled by one central unit to make sure that they're all working nicely together and not upsetting each other. So we purchased a mini mainboard from the Open Inverter shop that was. Um, that's like a cut down simplified version of the main kit that they sell. The main kit controls inverters directly but because of the Mitsubishi stuff being controlled by Canvas or over the Canvas network we figured we could use the mini mainboard as the VCU 
and use something else to control the cam bus side of things. Anyhow, we've got the mini main board, we've got it all rigged up with a throttle pedal, various switches, relays to simulate the contactors, all mocked up with breadboards and jumper wires and it was all working brilliantly. It was spitting out the data on the web interface that the Open Inverter guys have created. You could see the throttle position, the position was working, contact and control was working, it was all great. However, we still had a massive gap between that and the CAN bus control of the Mitsubishi part. So we parked it for the time being. We just stopped and moved back onto physical work on the Mini itself. Then there was a joyous moment when a chap on the Open Inverter Forum again called AOT, that's his username, but his company, I believe, is Historic Classics. I've got one of his boards here. So. Historic Electric. Historic Electric is his company. And he released the code, PCB plans, and bills of materials for a group of three boards one for the BMS, one for the VCU, and one to control the dashboard. His project was also a Mini and he fitted the Outlander components but instead of using the BMW battery he used the Outlander battery. So we got in touch with that guy and he sent us a couple of his spare boards which was really nice of him. Uh, we soldered them up. That's when we learned one of the main lessons to learn from when using open source information and that is it's constantly evolving and people are updating it all the time. We realised that one of the boards was actually a previous revision, so we ordered a bunch of boards to the latest software from a company, I think it was, I can't remember, it was a PCB manufacturing company, but we basically ordered three, five of each of the three boards, so that's 15 boards from America for £20 delivered. I couldn't believe how cheap that was. It's, it's crazy how cheap you can get things made nowadays. So we've got a whole bunch of them boards that we ordered. After they arrived, we started soldering them up. So you can see here, we soldered on the components and we ended up with three boards soldered up. Happy days. They all operate with Teensies. I think there's a 3.2, a Teensy 4 and a Teensy 4.1 maybe, something like that. Um, and all the code obviously was there available for us to use. So we sold the demo, got it all rigged up on the prototype board. This time that chap uses a VW Polo pedal, so we bought a Volkswagen Polo electric pedal. Another issue with that was that the connector didn't come with it and it turns out given the world shortages these are rare as the proverbial. So got it working. We had contact to control, we had throttle pedal, we had the BMS reporting battery. The only thing we didn't have was the inverter communicating with the board. It was at this point that things started to go wrong. Things started to go wrong. So the inverter data that's out there on the internet was confusing and some of it is not correct. That combined with some pretty schoolboy errors on my part meant that at one point I'm pretty certain I sent 12 volts down the CAN bus network which destroyed the BMW CSC modules, all five of them, and the inverter. So that cost me, I managed to source another set of CSC modules for £150 which was very lucky because normally people use them with the batteries so that you know the fact that someone had them spare was a miracle to be honest and another inverter I had to buy for £225 as I fried that so so at the point where I had to buy a new inverter and I thought I'd killed the batteries but it was just the CSC modules I decided that we were way out of our depth it's all right frying a few things in your shed or whatever at home or your office that's fine, you know, no problem. You can't mess about when you're talking about controlling a vehicle on the public highway, public road, whatever. It's not okay to have things that potentially aren't going to operate the way you think they're operate, or they're going to short out, or they're going to fry. It, it's dangerous. It's it's not on, it's not acceptable. So from our point of view, we parked the electrics, 
I'm not sure what we actually planned to do at that point. I think we were just continuing with the physical build and we just hoped that something would come along. At that point, we were pretty despondent, shall we say, on control and the Outlander stuff. So, what have we learned through this part of the project? We have learned an absolute shed load of stuff. Really, it's been a huge learning curve and there's still an infinite amount left to learn, in all honesty. But I'm going to break this down into the key points. So, the first thing we've learned is that the internet and the information available on it is not always complete and it's not always accurate. That's the key thing to understand. So, while there is a lot of information out there and you can use lots of it, you would also have to put your own work in to making sure that it's reliable, safe information and it makes your components operate in a reliable and safe way. The second thing we've learned is prototyping on breadboards with jumper leads. It's, it's okay for small, non-dangerous projects in your shed or whatever, you know, that's fine. But when you're dealing with high voltage systems, it's not acceptable to use breadboards and jumper leads. You need to be moving into proper wiring looms and proper electrical connections. You can't afford for things to be going wrong. It gets expensive very quickly. So the third thing we've learned is that when dealing with electrical components, COVID is still having a massive impact. And trying to order all the different components required for the PCBs is nigh on impossible from one supplier so you have to split your orders across multiple suppliers which means you incur multiple delivery charges multiple minimum order quantities and it makes things even more expensive than they already are alongside the physical electronics there's also the code the code writing i've had a play with this i've had a, done some research i really enjoy it it really interests me the code inside of things um but i've learned some serious lessons in code you get tidy people you get messy people just like you get people with good handwriting and bad handwriting you get different languages of code so we've got the code for the arduino another system used platform io i believe it's called and then the c plus plus is the teams is they have a different code again but if it's not a code it's a different piece of software to write the code so not only do you have to figure out coding you've got to figure out coding off different things so if you manage to find someone who can control an inverter, a Mitsubishi inverter, and someone else who can control a BMW battery, but their two pieces of code are written in different software, it's harder again to combine the two pieces of code into one piece of software. The fourth thing we've learned, and it's without a doubt the most important thing, is that when you're developing a vehicle to be used on the public highway, it, there's no room for errors or mistakes or things that are not being quite right it's ultimately it could cause serious harm maybe even death to somebody so it needs to be correct and that's why on this mini project we're no longer doing the controls from a diy point of view we're going to reach out to somebody who knows a lot more about what he's doing and use his skills and knowledge to make sure that we develop a safe reliable product that's a decision we've made and it it became apparent quite early on in the controls side of things that that was the right way to do things but we persevered for our own learning and to understand better what goes on in the vehicle but ultimately we're not competent enough with electronic controls to do this safely okay so thanks for watching um i genuinely mean that if you've made it this far on this episode Okay, so costs and time. <laughs> yeah, on, yeah. on this episode, we're not going to break down all the individual costs because there's so many components that we bought. It would just be several A4 pages of costs and you just, it'd be boring very quickly. So ultimately, we spent over £2,000 on this part of the project so far and we've got well over 200 hours into it. And it might not seem like we've got anything to show for that, but we have learnt an incredible amount, which is worth every penny, in our opinion. So, moving forward, we've got a better understanding of what actually goes into controlling an electric vehicle, which can only improve the quality of the product that we produce at the end of the day. So, 
we're happy with the situation and we'll make a plan moving forward okay so thanks for watching and I, I genuinely mean that if you've made it this far through this episode because I fully get that has been a slog the real lifetime scale was way worse than this condensed video I promise you um, if you could do the usual like subscribe comment follow if you've got any questions about anything we've done because I realize we've completely missed out a whole load of the detail feel free to comment and ask I'll, I'll answer anything openly and honestly no problem with that at all um, tune in for the next episode when we'll hopefully have a solution or at least a plan as to what we're going to do moving forward.